He was just a doctor. And, mm -hmm. and the, the best thing was nobody had to say, hey, oh, that Pierre Chang, that Chinese guy, or Pierre Chang, or, nobody's, no, nobody cared, right? Yeah. Just like, oh, he's, he's the Dharma Initiative guy. That was it. Uh, and that, that was a big step. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all having a wonderful day today. My name is Talal, and you are listening to the Popcorn and Soda Podcast, the show where we discuss all things movies, pop culture, and so much more. I want to thank each and every one of you for making me a small part of your day. On today's show, we're joined by a very special guest. He is one of the finest actors in the industry today. You've seen him on projects such as The Expanse, Birds of Prey, The Tick, and that's Dr. Pierre Chang on one of the most acclaimed shows of all time, Lost. On the show today, the very talented Mr. Francois Chow. How are you, Francois? I'm good, man. Hey, everyone. Thank you How's so you much for coming to hang out on the show today. I truly appreciate it. How have you been over this last year? We're living uh -huh. in such a crazy world. <laughs> what did 2020 look like for you? Uh, 2020 was... Uh... Was uh, actually it was better than I expected. Uh, and first of all, sorry, I'm I'm a little informal. I'm uh, I'm still on the island. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's how you like it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, You're uh, no, to never leave. <laughs> yeah, I know you can't. Um, 2020 was you know uh, as bad as it was, and it was I mean the bad stuff. You can, I can't even you know I can't even imagine, but. Um, you know, uh, the whole pandemic, the lockdown, everything. Uh, uh, I feel um, very fortunate in that, uh, you know, it didn't affect me uh, as much as, as obviously it affected a, a lot of other people. Um, my family and I, you know, so far we came through it fine. Uh, we, we uh, followed all the rules and it was good we masked up we stayed away from people we stayed home we did the whole thing and uh, it felt it felt good you know we uh we took every precaution and uh, we got vaccinated a few a couple of months ago so uh it's uh, it's getting there um but yeah it was it was okay in terms of uh you know <laughs> it's funny uh people were asking well you know didn't you like get all uh cabin fever being having to stay at home all the time? <laughs> I was like, you know, no, because that was that's that's what I usually do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at home. I'm either at home uh, taking care of you know my daughter and the dog, or watching TV. And then when I work, uh, you know, sometimes usually I go off on location for a couple of weeks, and I come back and I just sit home and watch TV. So it wasn't really that much different. <laughs> yeah, and um, it's so true. And as you mentioned, the life of a creative artist, where you're going back and forth, either you're on yeah. set or you're back at home or you're auditioning or you're reading yeah. different projects and whatnot. It's it's interesting to see that perspective from someone in the industry. And and I'm so glad that, you know, for 2020, it was it sounded like it was a good, whatever good can be defined yeah. as nowadays right. for you. And hopefully by the end of this year and the start of next year, you can start getting back to a normal or a new normal, whatever that may be. Sort of, sort of normal. Well, I, here, here I am. On the, <laughs> I guess I could. You know, these days everything is uh, is, is like a hush hush. So I don't know if I can if I can say anything. But I, I'm in, <laughs> I'm in Puerto Rico uh, right now, shooting a TV show, and uh, I guess uh, I can't say anything until the show airs. So yeah, sorry. We're, we're on a secret uh, <laughs> hush hush project. <laughs> yeah. You know, that, that's, that's so great to hear that there's still a lot of work and the resiliency of this industry where we adapt and especially someone like yourself who's been in the industry for well over 30 years. I am so fascinated by your story. Being a fellow person of color trying to break into this industry today and make my own path. I know the challenges that exist for us. 
you started doing this at a time where there is little to no diversity or inclusion at all in this industry. I'm just, I'm so fascinated by that. And where does this all begin for you? What were some of your influences growing up and what made you want to be in the arts? It's crazy because uh, I've always, uh, you know, I came to the U.S. when I was, uh, I think about seven, maybe. Uh, but I've always loved uh, TV and, and movies. So I, I, believe me, I, I, don't, I don't know anybody else who's watched more TV than I have. And, uh, <laughs> I've watched and I love movies. I watch a lot of movies. And I, I've always, you know, uh, liked, liked the arts. And uh, I started getting more interested in, in high school and then uh, started doing plays and stuff. And I thought, yeah, wow, this is kind of, this is kind of okay. <laughs> and then I went to, I went to uh, college, uh, got my degree uh, in theater. And then from there, I thought, you know, hey, this is, this is, what, I, I, this is what I think I found what I want to do. So I, I headed out to uh, LA. This was uh, 1984. Uh, because I wanted to do, I wanted to do uh, film and TV. Uh, a lot of my friends headed up to New York. Uh, I, I was pretty sure I could make a living because I, you know, uh, if you're going to go on Broadway, you got to be like a triple threat. You got to be able to oh, sing, yeah. and dance, mm-hmm. and, you know, act. And, uh, I, I remember all sort- your lines. There's no yeah. second take. <laughs> yeah, I can sort of carry a tune, but I can't really dance, and you know, it's not. Uh, <laughs> I was going to do that, go that route. So, but luckily enough, when I get to LA, I, I, you know, I started working and uh, uh, yeah, I've been very, very fortunate in terms of, uh, of uh, getting things or, 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 you know, just, I guess, being at the right place or something. I don't know. I, I always believe that luck is a, plays a big part in, in everybody's, uh, everybody's career. You know, I mean, there, there's, there's so many, I have a lot of friends and so many other people I know who are incredibly talented, uh, incredibly, you know, just, but for, for whatever reason, um, they didn't, they didn't get that, that break or they didn't get, they weren't there at the, you know, at the right time or, you know, but if you're an actor, you, you, you love it. So you, you can't help but do anything else. So you just, you just keep going. That's so true. And just having similar conversations like this with other creative artists, the life of an actor or an actress or anything within the creative arts, Mm -hmm. it beats the nine to five grind inside of an office any day of the week. And and as you mentioned, timing is such a big part of this whole thing, because you hear about the stories about some of the most talented people that were either in Broadway or in TV shows or in movies, but the career just never took off for whatever reason. And there's more people that have stories like that than someone like yourself, who's been consistently working over the last three decades. Yeah. I mean, like I say, you know, I just, you know, I see somebody else who's, and I always think, wow, uh, I don't know what, what happened, but uh, between me and this other person, but uh, here I am doing this and the other person is, is, is maybe struggling or something, uh, but it could be switched any time. So, you yeah. know, you know it's, it's, and it's, a, you know, you know how it is. It's, it's uh, people always think, oh, it's a tough job and uh, you got to have a thick skin and, and because there's so much rejection and stuff. And it, it's all oh, true, yeah. but, you know, yeah. it's all true, but it's, it's uh, you know, uh, younger artists ask me all the time, you know, well, what's your advice? Should I, you know, should I go into this or how, how do I, you know, when I was starting out, people, always, you know, even the teachers always saying, well, you know, you better, you better think of a backup career, right? <laughs> I'm like, well, what are you, what are you thinking? <laughs> uh, if I'm not, I'm not going to jump into it all the way, how am I going to find out if I can yeah. do something? Or not right. If I'm just sort of going, oh, I'll give it a shot. But uh, I, if I don't get what I want, I always have this in, in backup kind of thing. I, I always thought that was a little that, that was strange to me. It, it's just uh, it seems it seems very practical. But um, right, as an artist, you go well. It's it's a, it's a whole different thing, right? You know, if you're gonna be a doctor, you don't go well. If I don't make it as a doctor, I got this backup career of you know. Uh, whatever, a cook or something, right? I'm, I'm like, no, that's, you know, you, 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 if, you find, if you're lucky enough to find what you love to do and what you think you're meant to do, then 
it, you know, you just, you go all the way, you know. That's so true. And that analogy just cracks me up because my younger brother, he's becoming a doctor right now. Yeah. And I see how we're so wired differently, but his passion for becoming a doctor and not just becoming a doctor, but being a very successful doctor and being the best doctor that he can just translates right. into my love of the arts and me wanting yeah. to go all in, in this medium. And it's very yeah. fascinating to have that mindset, because as you mentioned, it's difficult when you're not fully invested and mm -hmm. it's, it's easy to understand and it's easy to point fingers why things aren't happening for me. But yeah. I, I really, I'm a firm believer that if you're one foot's in, the other's out. Are yeah, things really, are you going to get that break? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a lot harder, you know. It's a, and for me too, I think I've always thought that, you know, uh, people say, ask you, wow, what, what makes you, you know, how, how did you think you were an actor? How, how did you find, uh, you know, come up on acting and stuff? And, and over the years, uh, my thought is that acting is, you, you don't choose to be an actor, basically. After a while, you find out, oh, acting has chosen you. And that's, that's like a double-edged sword because it's like, oh man, that's great, <laughs> I, you know? But at the same time, you go, oh shit, uh, you know, I, I, that's it, I can't do anything else. <laughs> yeah, right? it's that creative bog that just gets yeah. into you. It's like a parasite, you can't get it out. <laughs> yeah, that's it, and it's great, you, you know, this is what you want, but at the same time, you just go, and, and if things, you know, go slowly for you, if things, don't happen the way you want it to. Um, you're still stuck. You still got that that acting bug, and you gotta. You just gotta keep going. You know. One thing that you had mentioned is uh, about having thick skin and telling the younger generation who ask for advice that hey get used to being numb to rejection because that's the only way to go forward. And one thing that is so true as an artist myself and just talking to someone with your experiences. You can get rejected 99 times out of 100, but that one yes, the high mm -hmm. of that is just so oh, yeah. crazy that it just, it's hard to explain to people that aren't into it what that truly feels like. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and the, the thick, thick skin part and, you know, the rejection, you know, you can, you can tell anybody, everybody as much as you want to, that the, you got to say, hey, listen, you know, you just got to deal with it. You just got to, you know, go with it. You know, you're going to get yeah. rejected times and it's easier to say that of course but you know when you're getting rejected it's it's not great right yep. it's just like oh, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you're and you're always thinking oh my god did i do something wrong i should have done this should have done that and uh you know you just have to it's not it's, it's human nature you can't not do that but you got to get do that and then forget about it and go on to the next thing or else, or else you know, uh, you're going to go crazy. You're going to drive yourself crazy. Yeah. Definitely. And that's just the, the life of a creative artist where it's always in, yeah. sometimes it's a blessing and a curse where it's always yeah. about the next one, where sometimes yeah. where it's like, we forget to enjoy what we're doing in the present. And we're always thinking about, all right, what's the next one? What's the next one? And I'm, I'm sure you get so many questions from so many people and especially diverse individuals like myself and just people of all different backgrounds that see someone who has had success in this medium. Besides the obvious, the one advice that you could give uh, to any young artist, what's the second most asked question that you get about this industry? Uh, well, I mean, it's always been, it's been kind of general. It's just, you know, yeah. any advice? How, how I get going or how do I start and uh, I've always uh, there's one thing uh, I've learned over the years and this is and I'm, I'm lucky enough to, to learn it uh, that right after I mean I've been doing this so almost four years right yeah. and uh, my thought of my, my thought of, of acting has almost gone like 180 degrees. You know, when I first started out, I was like, oh, I'm gonna be an actor. If I can play all these roles, I just, you know, I can, I can be this person and this person and I can put on makeup or I can put on, you know, a beard or whatever and I can hide in this character. And I'll be just all these different things, all these new people. And then I would go to auditions and then I would think, oh, this is what they want. This is, you know, they want this character. And I would try to, I would try to be that character, right? 
And over the years, I've, you know, luckily I found out, you know, that's, that's, that's not what they want. <laughs> my, my advice to young, young artists starting out is somehow find, and it's, it's, it's very hard to do, find who you are and that's what you bring to the table. They're not looking for, you know, the, the, this, per, this character or this character. They're looking, they see you through that character. You know, they're gonna go, oh, wait, that's, you know, that's not, that's, that's, that's great. That's not, you know, maybe not what we were thinking, but that was really, you know, you stand out because yeah. you bring yourself, you bring yourself and your, your truth and the passion or whatever, uh, and not try to, you're not acting like somebody else. You're, you're bringing yourself to the thing. And once I found that out, I would go to auditions and stuff and I would just be, you know, hey, this is me doing this. Uh, you have the confidence to do it. And it really, it really turned around, you know. Uh, that, that was one thing I discovered. I, again, that's just me. I could be totally wrong. So I, I don't know. <laughs> well, if it's someone with uh, almost 40 years worth of experience, there's definitely a lot of right in there. So that's a great advice for any young creative artist or even any artist that's in yeah. the middle of their journey and they're either feeling like it's a roller coaster where the highs are really high and the lows are really lows. Yeah. Uh, it's great advice that anyone can really apply to their everyday life, to their career. Exactly. Exactly. But like I say, it's very, it's very hard to figure out who, you know, who you really are. Because you, as an actor, you go in and you're, if you're like, it's like, you know, you go into a, an audition and you walk into the waiting room and you see like, you know, 10 other guys and already in your mind, you're going, ooh, <laughs> that guy looks like he could, you know, that guy looks like the, the character, oh man, <laughs> you know, go home kind of thing, right? And you see all these things, but you just got to block all that out and, you, and know that there's, only, there's nobody else like you, there's nobody else like that guy, it's just whatever they whatever they like whatever they choose it's not because you're bad and he's bad or you're good and he's you know he's better or whatever right yeah and that's the power of perception and that's something that we're all guilty of doing it's a human nature for again better or for worse where we're all just we perceive other things different than how you may perceive me and it's just very interesting how that little cycle is a consistent battle that we all go through every single day of our lives. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so now transitioning back, all of that amazing advice back to Francois Chow, almost 40 years ago, starting off in the industry. Do you remember your first audition and the first onset experience you had? The, uh, when I came to LA, um, my first, SAG, uh, you know, professional gig was a voiceover. Oh, so okay. it wasn't really, I guess, not on set. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I got, uh, again, you know, it's like being at the right place or whatever. I was, I did a voice for the, uh, they had a cartoon called G.I. Joe. Oh, in the <laughs> yeah. So I got that, but that was, you know, the voiceover, uh, voiceover actors, different, the um, very, I was like, like, you know, man, I got thrown into the deep end, like right away. Day one. I, like, uh, I don't know what's going on. Uh, but my first onset gig, I think I'm going back, was on a show called uh, Hill Street Blues uh, in, the late, in the like mid to late eighties. There was a cop show called Hill Street Blues. And my first role uh, was, uh, I was the like uh, the Asian uh, gang leader. Um, the, there was the scene was like there's a bunch of gangs that they they uh, brought together to into the police station and you know there was the, the, the African American gang and there was the yeah. uh, Latino gang and there was the Asian gang and you know, whatever right. And it was all uh, I had the leather jacket, I had the whole thing and uh, <laughs> the slick back hair and all that probably. <laughs> no, no that. Uh, in the eighties, I was uh, I had the uh, I had a perm. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> so my hair was a little you know it was long and it's like kind of curly and had a, a little bandana and stuff. Right. So uh, yeah, so it was fun. It was I had like I think two lines or something, and um, it, it was uh, it was pretty amazing. You know, 
Uh, and then, uh, and then I played a lot of gang views after that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> this shows you how far we've kind of come and yeah we're gonna tie into this a bit later but now like talking about a movie like birds of prey where you're kind of in in that kind of role as yeah. well so we're, we're gonna definitely deep dive into that and before we get into that we have to talk about which is by far one of the greatest tv shows of all time and that's lost and dr pierre chang is one of the best characters on that show and it's one of the most interesting characters on that show because what the showrunners, the directors, and yourself, of course, they use the less is more approach with this character where we only saw Pierre Chang, yeah. 17 episodes really across the entire series. It's really the gold standard for what an ensemble cast in a drama series is, is and what it should be like. Before there was a Game of Thrones, there was Lost. Every character served its purpose on that show they all get a moment to truly shine within their own confines of their story. As we were talking about, one of the most interesting characters was Dr. Pierre Cheng. You brought that character to life in just such an amazing way. It was almost that underlying threat throughout the entire series, the Dharma Initiative, all the pseudo names that Dr. Pierre Cheng had in all these orientation <laughs> videos. It's, I, I was watching some of them last night and it just... It's hilarious how there is a different character for every different, the orchid, the swan. It's, yeah. it's yeah. so amazing. So let's start at the beginning. How was that role presented to you? And do you remember the audition process, reading the lines for the first time? Oh, yeah, yeah. The audition process is, is, uh, was pretty standard, like most of the other auditions. I got the, mm. uh, my agent called me and said, you have an audition for this role. And, you know, you get the, uh, the scenes that they want you to prepare. And uh, I got the scenes, and it was uh, it was like a like a two page you know monologue, where basically the orientation you know hey welcome to whatever right I was like oh because I for me usually I like to uh, memorize uh, my lines for the auditions right so I said oh man I, this is going to be hard but you know uh, I memorized the two pages I went in and we started. And and I started the whole thing and I went through it uh, one time, uh, you know, no mistakes. And I stopped and we we're like, whoo, baby, that was, everybody's like, oh man, that was, <laughs> how'd you do that? I was like, I, I don't know, but I'm glad I got through it. <laughs> and I think uh, maybe one of the reasons I got cast was because I, you know, I learned those lines pretty well. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but then I got cast and um, uh, I thought, oh, great. Hawaii, here I come, right? I mean, uh, it's going, yeah. and then uh, they said, and then so they, the word came in, oh yeah, you're gonna be working uh, this next Monday and uh, you'll be going to uh, Burbank Studios. And uh, I was like, what? Wait a minute, <laughs> Burbank Studios? <laughs> Hawaii, what? <laughs> what, what happened to Hawaii? No. So it was the first two little orientation video clips, whatever, yeah. we shot in, uh, in Hollywood. Birdbank Studios. We went into the the set of there was a show on that time called Alias. You guys remember that? Yeah, with Jennifer Garner, right? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then mm -hmm. we went to the set, and at the end of the day, they were finished. They left, and we came in, and I stood in front of those mirror glass things, and I did this. <laughs> we did the thing. <laughs> I thought I think um, it was a one shot deal. Um, I, you know, again, I think maybe Lost also was one of the first shows that was very, uh, you know, security, uh, you know, they're very hush-hush about what they were saying. Yeah, a lot of secrecy with it, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it was just like a small thing they wanted to do. They had tried to film something in, uh, in Hawaii, and I guess it didn't really work out, come out the way they wanted to. So they said, they thought, oh, okay, let's just get like, like a real actor <laughs> and, and do it. And we'll, you know, we'll film it here. So we did that. It was supposed to be just that one thing. And, um, and then they called me like, you know, uh, a couple of weeks, a few weeks later. And they said, oh, we want you to do another little, you know, orientation video. I said, hey, sure. And then from then on, uh, they just kept, you know, just kept coming. Uh, I, I ended up after the first two, finally, by the third time, I was, I got to go to Hawaii, right? <laughs> well, I was, they finally uh, got you on the plane and they got you yeah, there, right? Eh? Yeah. 
uh, so it just it just you know mushroomed from there where I was you know I was going um, every I must have gone to like three or four times a season and then by the end when they had the whole you know uh, flashback, flashback going the, the right. whole like timeline right. swap yeah yeah and then they had you know the, the Dr. Chang you know was was live <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so it was great I was there for a while so yeah it was uh, it was cool. Oh, and the weird thing about the, the character is, you know, after I did it a while, and uh, the, it, it's so amazing how people perceive things. Because um, I'd be at the grocery store and people would come up and say, oh, man, that, your, your, your character is so creepy. And I, was just, I, don't, I couldn't watch it. It was so creepy. I was like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> uh, and other people would say, oh, something he's very mysterious and there must be something yeah. going on, right? And I thought, wow, that's, that's really interesting. Because, I mean, basically, they said, oh, this is like an instructional film. All you got to do is be really boring and dry and just give them the info and, you know, that's it, right? So I thought, hey, I can do that. So basically, I was just going, you know, this is the, giving the instruction. You know, you'll have to do this, and this, and this, and you do that, and that, and that, and that, and that. But... I guess, like I say, the perception is people watch it and they always think, oh, there must be something else going on there. <laughs> it's too weird. This guy's too weird. There must be something going on. So that, that was great for me. I think that's probably one of the reasons that they, they kept doing it. <laughs> but you know what? Ed, we have to give you a lot of credit for that, Ben. So I know you're way too humble to do that, but that character, you're right. Like me watching that show and seeing the right. character of Pierre Chang. Yeah. It, it might be, you know, the way they perceive uh, perceived it to you and explained it to you is make this boring science right. teacher in a high school right. lab but yeah. to us back to the less is more approach we're like who is this mysterious man yeah. giving us a mission statement almost as to right. what we have to do what our role is and yeah. that's largely due to your amazing acting because you made us believe that there's more to this character than just your typical science lab uh, character well and then they did you know with this, when they started with the uh, all those other names, uh, I showed up. I showed up in Hawaii one the one time, and I got the script. And I'm like, "Who's this guy? Wait a minute, this is not this like Marvin different. something." It's like yeah. it's Marvin Candle. It's it's Mark yeah. Wickman. He's wearing a you know he's he's like wearing a turtleneck and a, and a, and a blazer. He looks like a you know seventies uh, porn star guy or something. <laughs> He's talking the same thing. I was like, yeah, hey, uh, just give me the lines. I'll do it. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's, it's interesting because you mentioned just now when, like, the tra like the evolution of this character starting off as that one-off character and then slowly right. as the show goes along, yeah. starts getting more and more and more of a prominent role. And till yeah. this day, one of the best scenes I've ever seen in any medium was the premiere of season five, where we're starting off with someone's yeah. day in the, it's, I believe it's like in the 70s timeline. Yeah. And then out of, yeah, you're going on with the day, you don't know who it is. And then bam, Pierre Chang, Paul, like he just pops onto the screen. I remember watching my brother. It's like, oh, seeing this guy who's been right, right. instructional videos, like here and there throughout the series now felt like getting a chance to be a flushed out character. What was yeah. the biggest difference and the biggest challenge of now taking those little instructional videos into making Pierre Chang a three-dimensional character? Um, it was hard because uh, doing the instructional videos, it was just me, right? Um, it, fans always go, oh, so what was it like to work with, uh, you know, this, this person and this person? Uh, uh, did you guys you know, hang out together? You know, this and that. Like, well, I don't know, because I haven't met any of them. I just <laughs> go, go away. I'm by myself in the studio. We shoot the thing, and I'm done, and I'm gone. That was like the first, up, up until season five, pretty much. And then once we started, you know, in the, in the flashback thing where I got to meet the other people, um, that was really fun. That was great. Uh, you know, fine. as an actor, of course, you, you always... Uh, much better having somebody else to, to work with, right? Of course. Uh, yeah, so it was great. Um, I think the difficult, the, the change was, wasn't was difficult. It was just, it was, it was one of those things where the character, as you've been, as I was, as doing it, these little snippets, right? And uh, a little more, a little more, 
you find out kind of who he is. And then in the fifth season, you, you right. start with who he is, and then you have these little things where you find out he's done this and this and this. And then at a certain point, I was like, wow, well, it's too late to do anything now, but I mean, why is Pierre Chang such an asshole? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it, I didn't think I was that was the way it was going, but now it's there, and I can't I can't you know all of a sudden uh, change character. So it just kind of like okay, well I guess that's the way it is, and you have to kind of switch to how they were writing, you know, whatever it is they want to write. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because it just reminds you of that scene where he uh, where Ken Leung, Miles, and Hurley, uh, Hurley he brings a body over to that station and. Right. Dr. Chang just freaks out because Hurley's there and Hurley's like, yeah, I can keep a secret, but it just shows yeah, yeah. you how this yeah. character is just an asshole in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's wild. yeah. You know, one thing that I love about the show and watching the show at a different point in my life versus seeing how the medium has gone now is the diversity and inclusion of this show. Today we're talking about, hey, there's lack of representation on big screen movies, TV shows, Lost was doing this years ahead of like the things we have even today, like yourself, Naveen Andrews, Daniel mm-hmm. Kim. Can you talk about the importance of having that in a show like this, especially at a time where it still really wasn't prevalent to have people of color on a big Emmy winning TV show? Yeah. Uh, it was, it was really great. It was important in the way that, uh, especially for myself, and for uh, Daniel and, and Yunjin um, and Naveen, it's just like, uh, you know, before that, when I first started, when I, when I was doing like Hill Street Blues and stuff, right? Every, every show, every episode, every cop show, every whatever, yeah. detective show or, or uh, lawyer show. You're on Baywatch, you're at NCIS yeah, yeah. and all those things, yeah. They always have, the Chinatown episode, right? So, mm-hmm. so it's like, oh, who's going to work in this this episode of the show? Oh. And this Chinatown episode just has like a few, a, a few Asian characters or whatever, and we get to do, you know, we get to be the the, the drug lord or this or that or the Chinatown lord, and and, and every you know that, that that went along for a long time. Lost came along. Uh, we had Daniel and Yunjin as the uh, Korean couple. Um, and even then, it was done. It was done well in such a way that even though it was still, they were sort of oh the the, the exotic, the quiet, yeah, yeah, quiet Asian couple that you know right. keep to themselves, yeah. Right. It was you know it still had some of that, but they as as the season went, they got to do you know yeah. their character developed really well, and I thought oh wow this is great. Uh, for me, what was great was. Um, you know, I didn't even know my I didn't know my name was going to be Pierre Chang until uh, until like four seasons into the show. You show up in Hawaii, it's like yeah, you're Pierre Chang. It's like what? Yeah, uh, and that my being an Asian didn't have any. You know, I didn't have to speak Chinese or Japanese or whatever. I didn't have to. It, it, nothing was no no um, nothing to, to do with with being an Asian. He was just a doctor. And, and the, the best thing was nobody had to say, hey, oh, that Pierre Chang, that Chinese guy, or Pierre Chang, or nobody, no, nobody cared, right? Yeah. Just like, oh, he's, he's the Dharma Initiative guy. That was it. Uh, and that, that was a big step. That was, it, was, it, it felt great for me. And uh, uh, it's come, I think, like you say, loss was the, the beginning of, uh, it's come a long way. I mean, we've talked about the, um, the other the, the sci-fi show that I did a few years ago, The Expanse, yeah. was was it, I mean talking about diversity was was amazing for me. The character every character was just you know, uh, I mean diverse, and there wasn't you know it wasn't just there. Um, and I've been very very lucky to be able to, to have been part of, of shows like that. My my all time favorite uh, is is. Uh, my character in the tick um yeah walter <laughs> like <laughs> it's a great character he was like it was like putting on a, a you know an old t-shirt that fit perfectly and you didn't have to do anything i was like oh wow this is it this is great i you know this is me 
kind of thing. And again, uh, you know, even though he's a uh, an Asian guy, there was no no nothing said about a, anything about him being Asian, which I hope is it becomes sort of more of the norm, unless unless it's specifically something to do with you know with the character uh, that you don't have to say oh. You know, one of the things that still bugs me is, and it still happens, where you have uh, an Asian uh, character guest star in a show or something. And uh, even though now we don't have these Chinatown episodes anymore, thank God, uh, <laughs> because, because it's an Asian character, I don't know why, but they always have to speak like at least one or two lines in the, in the, the native language, right? So they oh, have to speak Chinese, about. right? That is a Chinese or Vietnamese or Japanese or Korean or something uh, with, with, among, with, with each other. And then, they, and then they switch to English. And I'm like, well, why are we just speaking English? I mean, it's not like we're, are we, it's not like we're keeping a secret from this other guy who doesn't speak. If that was the case, then I could understand, but we're just sort of all of a sudden because it's another Asian character we're speaking some Asian language oh, and we go back and we start speaking English. I'm like, well, no, it's, it doesn't, you know, it's just the mindset is still there. It's very slowly kind of hopefully changing, but it's, it's like, it's hard to, to make that change for some people. And that's yeah. it's really interesting that you bring that up because I think that is the best way to tackle all this is you don't need to have an explanation for having an Asian person, a brown yeah. person, or yeah. any type of person, a Vietnamese person in a role. And yeah. I think the, the more we start doing that, where it's just like, this is what it is. This is the <laughs> way society reflects like in our everyday lives today. And yeah. especially that little line you mentioned about having to speak your native tongue to another yeah. person of the same color. And like, I grew up in Canada. I grew up in Toronto. Like this yeah. English is my native tongue. And like, yeah. it's, and I think the more we start appreciating that and accepting yeah. other people's cultures, it's just, we're end of the day, it's just, it's going to open up so much more opportunity for so many more people. And as someone like yourself, who's seen all the highs and the lows of this industry with diversity and inclusion, it's, it's really fascinating to, to really see where the next 10 years or the next five years, especially with all the uproar about diversity and inclusion, stop Asian hate, Black Lives Matter. Let's see mm -hmm. if you actually implement this within the arts. I, I you know, this time around, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm cautiously hopeful. In, in the, all the years I've been doing this, it's been like, a, it's almost like, a, I don't know, every 10 years, there, there's something, uh, something happened. Uh, years year, years ago, we had uh, Margaret Cho and All American Girl, first Asian American family sitcom, and it was like, oh, this is great. It's going to be open up so much, uh, you know, so many things for, for for people of color and this and that. Nothing happened, right? Maybe yeah. a few years later, you have uh, this movie, The Joy Luck Club. Everybody's going, oh man, this is the first uh, major motion picture with an all, pretty much all Asian cast, and it's going to be this and that, it's going to be great. We're going to have a lot of It was a little bit, and then boom, back to where it was. And it just kept going like that for a while. With a few years ago with Crazy Rich Asians, that's yeah. sort of the same feeling. That's going, oh, this is going to be great for uh, actors of color. It's going to be Asian American and this and that. And I was like, well, yeah, okay, let's see what happens. I think what is going to keep it going now is that we have a much more, especially the younger people, we have a much more uh, astute, like, you know, audience. And we have social media. And I think with social media, people are going to, you're going to keep pushing it. It's not going to, people aren't going to forget, right? People yeah. are going to go back. They're not going to slide back because uh, they're not, we're not gonna let them, uh, you know, with starvation, with the Black Lives Matter, all that stuff, it's there. It's not like, uh, you know, oh, that, that was then now, you know, forget about that, let's go back to where we were. No, it's, it's here to stay. And it may change, it may become something else, but I think it's, uh, that's why I'm, 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 you know, carefully optimistic that, that things are gonna get better. That, uh, 
especially for the younger generation. I, you know, it, I did a, a, a Zoom thing with uh, some younger uh, actors and I really, it really got to me how great it was that I could list like four or five, even more TV shows, movies, whatever, where they had an Asian person as a series regular. There, you know, a lot of shows, a lot of the, a lot of shows now, and uh, I thought, wow, you know, I would, I would, when I first started out, that was something that you would never thought of, right? You go, oh, uh, that's yeah. not gonna happen. But now, you know, slowly, slowly, it's, 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 it's changing, and I hope it keeps changing. I hope we don't slide back. Yeah, I agree with that, and and as you mentioned, just it's almost like the great reset in many ways. And as you said, like there's moments of, is this going to be it? Is this finally the tipping point? And then it kind of goes right back to status quo and then right Right. back. But I feel like, you know, as you mentioned, uh, social media, it really could be, again, it could be the start of a new Mm -hmm. era and a start of a new type of just accountability in this Mm -hmm. industry. So that's We'll just have to wait and see where this goes. I want to touch up on just a few more questions about Lost because okay. I'm such a major fan of the show. Now, I'm from a generation of people that actually watched the show after it after it aired through the power mm-hmm. of streaming. And I, I knew of the show growing up, but I never watched it. And then when I finally got into it, my brothers and I, it was just like, like I was living under a rock. This is the best show on TV. How often... Do you get someone coming up to you or just someone like in a conversation like this saying, I just streamed Lost last month or a year ago with my family and it's just epic? Yeah, no, a lot. And you know what? The best thing for Lost is um, that you can binge now. When it, when it first aired, one episode a week, right? Yeah. And you go, okay, you watch this week. And then uh, the next week, because uh, I have to confess, I didn't start watching it until like season eh, season three, maybe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> once I did, I got, I got caught up. But I watched the you know the weekly show. But by the next week, I would be like, well, wait a minute, what happened? What happened over here? Wow, you know, they would bring up something that you sh- you think you should know from something they set up before, right? And you go, oh, wait a minute, I, you know, it's it's because there's a lot of stuff going on. So one week, you gotta wait till the next week, you gotta wait till the next week. For me, it was very, it was like, oh, every week I gotta like, I gotta watch that. They have like a little, yeah. you know, uh, the, uh, what, what do you call it? Like uh, a little tease or something like that. Yeah, so what's gonna happen next week kind of thing. Yeah, yeah the kind of review of what they would happen. You know? Yeah. All right, so you gotta, now with, with, with when you can stream it, you can binge it, you can watch like two, three episodes at a time and you, you can just, it's, it's right there. You don't have to, you know, it really helps to just go, oh, yeah, that's it. Because uh, sometimes they would set up something in one episode, and I swear to God, like two, se- two seasons later, <laughs> in another episode, like it pays off, and you go, wait a minute, didn't that, wasn't that, I think, did they really set that up, or did, is it, did they just get lucky and, and, have it, and have it pay off there, right? Uh, that's really interesting. And you know what? He's talking about streaming. It's now on Disney Plus, and it just, the power of Disney and streaming yes. where everyone just wants content now. This yeah. show is being exposed to millions of people, hundreds of millions of people worldwide now because of this. Right. Do you think that there is more life for the show, especially in a world full of reboots, uh, continuing old stories, uh, kind of refreshing up like the entire island story, the Dharma initiative? Those are such fascinating story points. Do you think there's more life for the show? You know, uh, they're, they're rebooting like all sorts of weird things right now. So you never know. Uh, my, my personal feeling is that I think it's best left the way it, it, the way it ended. You know, to try to, to like, I don't know, spin off something about the island or spin off something about, you know, whatever. Uh, I don't know, it could work, but I, I, I don't, you know, the. The whole show itself left, left such a, a, a strong memory for you that yeah. it's why would, you know, it's like a classic, right? 
people always think, oh, we're going to remake, uh, you know, some classic movie. And you thought, well, why, right? The movie's still there. You could just watch it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think for Lost, um, I don't know. I mean, for, for, for a lot of fans, they, they, they want to see what happens, right? But uh, I don't know if they can get the band back together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll just have, we'll just see, and uh, a lot yeah. will be said over the next year as this show just explodes onto Disney Plus, and yeah. the amount of people that are going to discover this for the very first time ten years after it ended. It's, oh, been, it's been like 10, 11 years already. That, that oh, it it's it's wild, and yeah. you, gotta, uh, you mentioned it briefly. I, I'm really curious, especially as someone who is part of this mammoth iconic show. And there was that whole uproar a couple of years ago with the finale of Game of Thrones and Breaking <laughs> Bad. One, what did you think about the finale of Lost? And two, can you ever win in a situation like this where the expectations are just so high and everyone's got their own idea of what's going to happen? And then Nine times out of ten, it usually doesn't. Can, yeah, no, is it even I, possible? Yeah, I don't think you can win. I think the, the writers they knew straight off, you know, once the, the show became so popular, that there isn't any way they were gonna, you know, do something that that that's gonna please everybody. Yeah, uh, I thought that there were two camps, right, of, of fans that I found. The one side is the the, the ones who love all the little little mysteries, the little, you know, things that they set up that they, they, they usually don't, don't, don't answer. They don't, <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't turn out to be anything, yeah. Yeah, they like set it up and, you know, and they're like, oh my God, what does this mean? What does this mean? And then there's the other side who just watched the show and kind of, you know, kind of go along with it. And thought, oh yeah, this, you know, they're not really invested in, into the mystery of, you know, why is there a polar bear on the island? Why is there, uh, you know, what is Smoke this monster or Jacob or yeah. Right, right. Who's uh, you know, what is all that? Um, so the side that wants all that stuff, I think was very disappointed. I had a friend of mine uh, call me up after the finale. He said, God damn you, I wasted five years of my life just watching this show. What's so wrong with that? <laughs> like, hey, oh, and then the, the other people, I, for, personally for me, I, I'm on the other side. I was like, hey. You know, it's a nice. You're more with the characters and what happens and and, and the storyline. And um, I thought, you know, that what they came up with was was fine. They could have come up with something else that I would have liked. That's that's okay too. Or um, you know, at least they didn't do a. I don't want. I mean, my blood pressure gets really high. When I think, <laughs> oh no! When I, when I think of Game of Thrones. <laughs> Ooh. That's a whole nother podcast for a whole nother day. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, it's so true. And in every iconic TV show, it's, yeah. there's never been, I can think of a show, at least in my lifetime, that everyone was happy with the way it ended. And maybe yeah. that's the whole, I don't know, mystery of, of, of our human psychology is maybe you should yeah. learn to appreciate it more as it's going along and not let that one finishing touch kind of sour the last five seasons i personally i i enjoyed the ending i i understand how difficult it is and having someone yeah. like damon lindelof and jj abrams kind of producing it it's mm -hmm. tough you can't please everyone yeah. so yeah. here's yeah. hoping to you know the next big tv show that's going on that they maybe get it a bit right compared to some of these other shows that for better or worse I, just weren't able to wrap it up yeah i think the uh, lost I don't know if it was the first, but it was pretty much one of the first shows that had the uh, um, the story arc went all the way through, right? Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't episodic like that's how it used to be. You know, all the shows before was like this episode this week and it ended, and the next episode was something else, yeah. and, uh, and there's no continuing story. I don't know. I guess uh, like X Files was sort of a hybrid. Yeah, it's like a like an alien of the week kind of thing, right. a mystery of the and week. It, it had that underlying thread throughout the entire series. Right, it had the, the alien stuff going through it and, and what happens. Uh, and I think I think that might that thread going through the shows is what uh, when you have an ending is uh, you, you get a lot more expectations as, as to what it's going to be. But if you have just once a week, then you go, oh, okay, it's, you know, the characters aren't really changing. They're just having different episodes each week and right. ending. Like, oh, 
it ends, right? But you have this long story arc and it ends and you go, ooh, you expect something. And if they don't do it right, man, you just, you know, <laughs> they yeah. pay for it. They pay That's for it. It's like now. <laughs> Oh well, pff, like a David and Dan from Game of Thrones. It's it's I I love that show, but if you don't hear from them and like at all, like recently, it's they're kind of I don't want to say they're in hiding, but it's there's damage yeah. control almost. And it's it's the most I've ever seen in any show, where Game of Thrones, man, that was the show that was like you know I, I loved it. I watched it all, the time and then it was like so huge. And then the end, the way they they last like three episodes, I was like what <laughs> yeah it definitely and felt really, a little rushed and uh and just all the things came out of nowhere and i think that really showed the, the, that really kind of those two guys took a big big hit for that i don't yeah. know if uh, you know maybe they can recover and people will forget it but i don't know <laughs> yeah we'll just see what happens now yeah. <laughs> bringing this all back together with francois Cha here we talked about the love of film TV and as you mentioned like your your passion I can just feel it right through this zoom call here now one of the last movies that I watched in a movie theater was Birds of Prey and I got to see you on it's it's just cathartic how I'm talking to you and my one of my biggest passions in life is going to the movie theaters and you're one of the last people I saw personally for yourself what do you miss the most about going to the movies or just in general having that big experience on the biggest screen uh, well, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you how old I am now. I used to love going to the movies to see the big screen, right? Um, over the years, the, the change, because I, I, I don't know if it wasn't as fun because the audience was, was not, maybe, the, maybe it's just me, but I didn't feel like the audience was as you know, interactive or being immersed no, into the experience. As revered, as revered of the film as, as I was. And, and I know mm. that, I mean, really, you know, uh, there's a lot of, it's like, there's a lot of talking. There's a lot of things yeah, going yeah. on. I'm like, Love their phones out and like, yeah, I'm like, please, let's just, just focus on the movie. Okay. You know, da, da, da. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the experience, right? You want to go and you, you, you can, you can, uh, Deal get lost you. in the magic of right. movies and forget it, about all of life's which is great, problems which is, or whatever. Yeah, which is what a lot of people go to the movies for, and so forth. But you know, for me, I'm just like a, you know, I'm like this, I'm like the grumpy old man. I'm like, you know, shut the hell up! I'm gonna try to watch this movie. <laughs> so, uh, and then now, man, you can get like an 80 inch TV. It's just basically the same thing. You sit in a room and it's like, oh, you know. Uh, um, so yeah, no, I mean, definitely um, going to the movies in the big screen was something that uh, I love to do, especially like big, you know, they used to do the big, uh, what do they call these big epics, right? Yeah, like, yeah, like Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, the IMAX screens and everything. Yeah, the big panorama screen and yeah, you, know, yeah. I, uh, you can't do that at home on TV, but um, it, yeah, but, it, but the movies have changed too, right? So they don't, they don't really do those those anymore now with the cgi stuff they can do it but it still looks like yeah CGI. you can yeah. tell it's cgi from a mile away yeah, yeah you know it's you know it's, it's not the, you know they didn't go to you know it's like it's like watching lawrence of arabia you know they were in the desert it's not like, right <laughs> but now yeah. you watch the house and it's you go oh yeah i don't think they were i don't think they went to that location to film this i think they <laughs> <laughs> it's shot in burbank in a soundstage <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we'll just see what happens with the future of film. And that's my last question for you specifically as someone who's in the industry, who's working, who's in Puerto Rico right now. Personally, what is the future of this industry in a post-pandemic world? Do you think things will eventually return back to the way they were? Will be will it be more efficient now? It's one of the lessons that were taught and learned over this last year. What's your perspective on how things are going to shape out? I think... Um... As technology changes, uh, you know, I have a feeling the the film industry has to come up with something that's going to get people back into the theaters yeah. because that's that's what they. I mean, 
you know, in the 50s when the films were great and when, when, when television came out, all of a sudden, you know, people stayed home because they had television. Going to the movies was not the, the, the thing that they, they had to do all, all the time. It was still great, but TV took a big chunk out of the film industry. Mm -hmm. I think now, um, again, TV is still there, streaming, uh, you know, Netflix, Amazon, who all these mm -hmm. all these streaming yeah. services, uh, you know, uh, creating their own projects, right? Um, that's taking a big chunk out of go uh, uh, like like what we're used to a film mm -hmm. going to a Definitely. theater, watching it on the big screen, the whole experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, but I think you know, like everything else, the people will figure out what what uh, what works and what what you know what they'll do and things will change. Um, I think it's it's still um, as as an actor. Uh, it's still going to be the same. I mean, we're still, it's weird. I, I did uh, during last year, during, during COVID, I did a, uh, a video game. Um, Ghosts of with, Shushima, correct? Uh, yeah, that was that too. But I, after that, I did another one. Uh, where okay, I, gotcha. I had the whole mo -cap motion cap but, and everything. Yeah, on. yeah. Was, we're, we're in the, the, the studio and we're doing stuff and it, it's a little weird at first, but you know you get you know, get used to it. But that's a big industry coming up for a lot of actors, and uh, you you go, wow, it's this this is going to be the future of, of, you know, it's not, uh, you know, before you can go and you get hair, makeup, you got wardrobe and all these things. It's 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 all practical. Here you're you're in this tight suit with all these little balls on you, and you're you're still doing the same thing, but the technology is that they add all this stuff on you. And the finished product is you go, wow, that's, that's, it's scary good how, how things came out, right? You go, you know, because uh, for Ghost of Tsushima, I, they scanned my face and this is that. And I took you know, hours just sitting there going, making all these weird faces that they can, uh, they can take pictures of. And then uh, the finished product was like, wow, that's me. <laughs> that looks exactly like me. Wow, it's crazy. It's crazy. I think uh, the industry is changing. It has to change to adapt to whatever technology that's coming up. Um, you never know. I mean, slowly, I think there's some like, uh, I don't know if it's going to work, but there's the, uh, the 3D stuff, not 3D, but the virtual stuff. Yeah, like the, like the Mandalorian. But, I think it's one of those shows that uses those virtual backdrops. Is that what you're talking about? Or that it's almost like, uh, I don't know how they're going to do it, but you know, the games now. Were, 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 yeah, like the were, virtual helmets and whatnot. And you're like, you're there. And you're, you're, you're yeah. moving around, right? I think they can do that with, with, uh, with movies, right? I mean, where, be, you're, yeah. where you are set, you're right there in the scene 360 and you can see, you know, you see what's going on as opposed to just watching it like this. Uh, that that's that's it could be there, but I don't know. That would be a little freaky for me. But you know, who knows? <laughs> hey, we'll just see what happens with the yeah. rise of technology and just as, as you mentioned, that's actually a really. I've thought about that idea before, and I've had that conversation with other creative artists who really feel that could be the next cutting edge technology where you're yeah. no longer watching the movie, you're in the movie. In, you're in the and movie. Yeah. We'll, we'll see what happens, and it just shows you the resiliency of this industry with. When you have billions of dollars on the line, people are going to yeah. get creative and they'll, they'll find a way to make you come back. They'll, they'll, they'll find a way. Yeah, they'll find a way to keep up. Beautiful. As you wrap up with the great Francois Chow, it's now time for a segment I like to call the final act. Mr. Chow, right. I'm going to ask you 10 rapid fire questions about your likes, your dislikes, but here's the kicker. I'm going to give you 60 seconds to see if you can get through all 10 questions. You up for it? All right. All right, I'm ready. Movies or TV shows? Movies. Theater or watch at home? Watch at home. Favorite movie? The In-Laws. Favorite TV show? Star Trek. The original. One, se 
the original. All right, make sure to put that in there. <laughs> One sequel better than the original. Um, I, I'll go with I'll go with Godfather. I, I, I guess that's true. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Should Hollywood reboot Back to the Future? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I I think I saw that answer coming. Uh, <laughs> summer or fall? Uh, summer. Does pineapple belong on pizza? Yes. Yes. All right. Yeah. Interesting I, answer. I am at that camp. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite lost character besides yourself? Curly. And lastly, describe the creative arts in one word. Um, challenging. Bam. Got through all the questions. And hey, I appreciate your honesty, especially on that uh, pineapple on pizza. It's definitely... Uh... <laughs> I, I can see that you're not are you not a fan it's okay <laughs> but hey that's the beauty of life what i may not enjoy you may enjoy and that's the subjective nature of art everyone's go, got their own opinion francois yeah. thank you so much for being a guest on the show today but more importantly sure. thank you for the building blocks that creative artists like yourself have paved for people of color and i know today me trying to break my own path into this industry i know it's a lot easier today because of people like yourself you provided one of the most memorable characters that I've ever seen in this medium. And I'm truly grateful for that. I wish you all the best in all your upcoming projects. And I look forward to having you back on to discuss the next one. Anytime, anytime. Bro.